You've studied from a school called St. Javier School. Yes, sir. What are Jesuits? The French and British applied the policy of subsidiary alliance to many Indian princely states. Uh, do you think that they have applied this policy to other countries also? Uh, you play football. Yes, sir. Uh, why football is not uh, as much as popular as cricket in India? You also mentioned that you uh, wanted to become a writer someday. And yes, in fact, sir. I can see that your father is a, a journalist. Yes, sir. So tell me, uh, if there is a historical truth, there is also something called post-truth. What is post-truth? Yes, please do. Good morning, madam. Good morning, sir. Good afternoon. Good morning, Take sir. your seat. How are you? Very Kaise? good. Okay. Okay. Uh, you are Siddharth Shukla. Siddharth, will you prefer um, English as your uh, medium of uh, interview? Yes, sir. Good. Siddharth, you must have noticed that uh, uh, we have taken adequate care when it comes to COVID, and we have taken many steps. And one of the steps is that we have kept your chair at adequate distance. So you are uh, at a safe distance from anybody in this room. Yes, right? sir. Uh, another advantage of it is that uh, you can choose to remove your mask because you are at a safe distance and you will be feeling uh, better uh, without mask, right? You'd like to remove? Yes, sir. Please do. So you are comfortable? Yes, sir. And uh, you yourself are not showing any symptoms? No, sir. You are va vaccinated or not? I am vaccinated, sir. You are vaccinated. Fine, then Siddharth, let us start. To begin with, I want you to introduce yourself to the board members. Sir, I am Siddharth Shukla. I was born at Ajamgad, Uttar Pradesh. I had my early childhood and education in Northwest Delhi, St. Xavier School, to be proper. I, I am a graduate from History Honours from Delhi University, Khalsa College. Since then, I have been preparing for Civil Services examination. This is my second attempt and here I am, sir. Okay, Siddharth. So, you are um, basically from Delhi, right? Yes, sir. You, you have uh, considered uh, UP as your home ca uh, home district, but yes, you have studied in Delhi, you have always lived in Delhi, so you are more of a Delhi person. Yes, sir. And you have studied from Delhi University. Yes, sir. History honors. Right? So, um, you have studied from a school called St. Javier School. Yes, sir. What are Jesuits? Sir, Jesuit is an order of uh, Christianity. They emerged in Portugal around Spain. Jesuits are an order of Christianity that spread. Uh, they are tasked with spreading Christianity in the eastern part of the world. Uh, Sir Francis Xavier was the founder of the Jesuit order. He along with St. Loyola of Assisi, uh, they travelled a vast distance from India, Japan, China and they established missionary schools for spreading the religion of Christianity. Sir. Okay, and so basically it's about spreading uh, Christianity. Yes, sir. They are what missionaries. What exactly Jesuits do nowadays? Are they sticking to a conversion or they are doing something else also? Sir, the Jesuits have a chain of schools and hospitals in various parts of the Eastern Hemisphere as well as Western Hemisphere. So, their aim is to convert people because they want to spread the religion of Christianity. But they do a lot of charitable works and they are not overtly converting people to say, sir. They are doing a lot of developmental works, a lot of human development works. My experience in study, uh, as of studying in a Jesuit institution have been very good, sir. It's been good. So, you are still uh, Hindu? <laughs> I am still a Hindu, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Siddharth, if I look at your, uh, uh, this uh, DAF, uh, a basic thing that came into my mind is that you never wanted to be an administrative officer. You wanted to be a uniformed officer. Is that true? No, sir. I wanted to be an administrative officer. So, why you appeared in CTS so many times? Sir, I appeared in CDS because of some circumstances due to which I have to go for a government job immediately after my graduation that I have to have some job. But I always wanted to be an administrative officer, sir. My father prepared for civil service examination and it was said from childhood that I have to become an IES officer and that was that. In our country, uh, usually it is the father in the society that decide what a young person should be doing rather than the person himself discovering it. When will you discover that what you want to be? Sir, I discovered, uh, I thought about what I want to be when I uh, left school and I thought about that I would like to be a writer. But I left that dream around some time and I thought that the best... Uh, we'll come back to this writing thing, but since you studied history and history honours to be precise yes, from Delhi University, uh, tell me what exactly uh, is the... Uh, 
understanding of uh, meaning of history when it comes to uh, say historians like uh, Collingwood. Historians like? Collingwood. You studied Collingwood or not? E.H. Carr? No sir, I have not studied E.H. Carr. How many no. books, histo history books you have studied? I have studied a lot of history books. I have studied the history of Far East and I have studied the history of United States of America, of modern okay. West. I am talking about a historiography. Uh, E.H. Carr has defined what is history in some terms. I have read that essay of Carr, I believe, sir. Yes. In which he says that history is uh, uh, learning about historical truth from an objective point of view. What is historical, uh, historical truth? What, what is truth? Sir, I am thankful that you mentioned historical truth. Uh, you must have uh, read uh, in yesterday's newspaper that the uh, government of India has come out with the uh, advertisement saying that they uh, are revisiting uh, the historical truth of our country, especially uh, the northern, uh, uh, northern India. Uh, what exactly is the problem in the current historical truth that uh, we have studied, you have studied, that government is not easy about? Sir, history has evolved like all other social science subjects. Now, sir, we see that history evolved from a nationalist perspective to a Marxist perspective to the post-Marxist perspective or subaltern perspective. Some people in our political elite or the political class believe that history is written from a political point of view and the histories of some marginal communities or some major communities is neglected. They believe that history was written for a political purpose and now they intend to correct that problem if there is any. I believe, sir, the history that we have read, the history that is taught in the NCRTs or the, any government institution is up to a standard very good, but we can always look for reforms or improvement in any social science. Since you mentioned uh, historical truth and you also mentioned that you uh, wanted to become a writer someday and yes, in fact sir. I can see that your father is a, a journalist. Yes, sir. So tell me, uh, if there is a historical truth, there is also something called post-truth. What is post-truth? So we are presently living in the so-called post-truth era in which truth has become a very subjective, the subjective thing. No one is looking at, at, uh, at truth as an objective phenomenon, but everyone wants their own version of truth. So in our age, everything is contested. There is no facts or there is no objective uh, definition of anything. We have people with certain views who contradict everything. So we are living in a post-truth era in which truth itself has become a contested terrain. We cannot definitely say that this is the truth or this is we are. This is what we consider as a. Why do we need truth at all? We need if narratives can work, then why do we need truth at all? Because, sir, as Nietzsche said, if nothing is true, then everything is possible. If we have no consensus among ourselves that this is a good value, truth is a good value, honesty is a good value, then how would we arrange our livelihood? How would we. What would be good and what would be bad? Then everything is possible. If there is nothing true, then everything is false, then how do we define our life? How do we say that this is a good thing to do or this is a bad thing to do if nothing is true? So truth is the basis on which humanity and our cooperation is built on, our civilization is built on. Fine Siddharth, thank you. So, Siddharth, <coughs> you know India is having a very long coastline. Yes sir. But unlike the Japanese or Chinese or Europeans or Americans, Indians have not done uh, well in seafaring business. They have not traveled far and wide through sea. Yes. How as a student of history you have looked at this question? What could be the reasons? Sir, India's seafaring history has some good phenomenon as well, sir. We have the imperial cholas who were very good at seafaring. Their navies used to have might in the Southeast Asian countries as well as Sri Lanka and Maldives were their colony at some time, we can say. Uh, we have not been a good seafaring country because our empires have been built in the north in regions which were very far away from the sea. And the southern part of our uh, country or the southern peninsula has not seen the emergence of last empires other than Vijayanagar and Cholas who were good at seafaring. Another thing has been our neglect of navy. Any great power that emerges in the north of India, they consider themselves to be rulers of north India or the India proper as well. They did not want to expand themselves to far away places. And, uh, the trade that our country carried on was primarily carried by traders and monks and monasteries used to, to widen our sphere of influence rather than political power. So our The French and British applied the policy of subsidiary alliance to many Indian princely states. 
डू यू थिंक दैट दे हैव अप्लाइड दिस पॉलिसी टू अदर कंट्रीज ऑल्सो सर सब्सिडरी अलायंस पॉलिसी इन इफेक्ट वॉज द मीनिंग दैट वी आर हैविंग अलायंस विद द पोलिटिकल एलिट ऑफ अ रीजन द पोलिटिकल पावर इन से मैसूर और से हैदराबाद हैज़ अ पॉलिसी विद द ब्रिटिश दैट दे विड स्टेशन देयर फोर्सेज देयर एंड दे विल डिफेंड दैम इन साउथ अमेरिकन और अमेरिकन कॉलोनाइजेशन वी सी दैट द स्पेनिश पावर एंड द पोर्तुगीज पावर दे डेवलप्ड कंप्रेडोर्स इन दोज कंट्रीज दैट वर पार्ट ऑफ द एलिट दैट यूज टू कोऑपरेट विद द कॉलोनियल पावर्स सो अ सॉर्ट ऑफ सब्सिडी अलायंस सिस्टम वॉज यूज इन फार अवे रीजन्स इवन इन चाइना वी सी द कंसेशन द वट बेनिफिट्स द प्रिंसल स्टेट्स डिराइव फ्राम द सब्सिडी अलायंस इन द लॉन्ग रन नन सर इन द शॉर्ट रन देयर दे कैन कैरी ऑन देयर पोलिटिकल पावर इन द लिमिटेड स्पेयर दैट द रेजिडेंट पावर अलाउड दैम the resident the british or the french they used to station in the princely state which had subsidiary alliance he was all powerful but he gave some power such as internal affairs and who would you uh, appoint as a noble who would you appoint as a military aristocrat that was given to the princely state but in the long run they were fattened like oxygen devoured at the right time we claim equality with america today do you think that we also enjoy equal power we see sir in a historical perspective after 1991 we are living in a unipolar world in which the us is the global hegemon the us can go and invade iraq the us can go and invade afghanistan and the world will look at a distance but even if we change our the status of a state that is part of india since our independence we have to give a lot of answer in the international forums and to international powers to so, so to say sir that we have political equality with the us in international affairs is chimerical Do you think that we have accepted many American companies in Indian economy under their political pressures, so like Twitter and Twitter and Facebook and Walmart and Amazon? We see, sir, that uh, the 1991 reforms were to some extent shaped by pressure from U.S. and U.S.-based institutions such as IMF and World Bank. As of now, we see, sir, our government is pushing back against U.S.-based institutions who have who believe that they have power to. defy our government because they are backed by the united states government so we see sir there is some pressure from us but india is pushing back and now we have we do think that we have arrived at the world stage and we can push back against nations who consider themselves mightier than everyone else okay so do you think that we are becoming subsidiary allied nation to us now no sir we have our strategic autonomy when we see that uh, institutions like quad are emerging we cannot say that we have joined quad under us pressure our active participation in quad is our own based on our own volition or under american pressure sir i believe it is based on our own volition because quad emerged as a significant body only when we were under chinese pressure only when we pushed for quad unless we joined the quad or unless we expanded the malabar exercise there was no quad okay uh, turning to economy when was this reserve bank of india established The Reserve Bank of India was established in 1935 under the Government of India Act. It was around that time that Reserve Bank of India was established. So, was it a fully government-owned institution, or it was partly owned by the private players? It was uh, partly private. It was nationalized in 1949, I believe, sir. So, did uh, do you think that they enjoyed autonomy, polit pol policy autonomy, and before 1949? To some amount, sir, they were politically autonomous. in spite of the fact that they were not fully owned by the government they enjoyed autonomy due to the fact that they were not owned by the government or they had an autonomy because so today it is entirely owned by the government so do you think that rbi is still autonomous i believe sir rbi is one of the institution that is autonomous at present and which other institutions are autonomous apart along with rbi there is the election commission of india there is ups a lot of institution are autonomous but the autonomy in rbi is unparalleled i believe sir as of present but since independence rbi is one of the most autonomous institution in our country and rbi works professionally and in an autonomous manner unlike other institutions so rbi when rbi formulates up monetary policy to reduce interest rate how it uh, benefits the government the government is the biggest borrower of our economy if we see the fiscal deficit of the government is of the size of 12 lakh crore so if the rbi reduces the interest rate the government would government would borrow at a cheaper in, cheaper rate of interest so fiscal deficit would come down so government how, and how it will affect the choice of entrepreneurs about uh, the machines with their labor saving uh, machines they will prefer or capital saving machines they'll prefer so when cap when capital becomes cheap when in, yeah capital becomes cheaper 
so they can go for labor saving machines that will necessarily uh, reduce employment elasticity that means it will generate less employment per crore investment we can say that sir. so is it f in favor of the people of india in some extent sir we see that if rbi uh, do not reduce is the interest rate and the interest rate is very high and the interest rate growth differential uh, is very less so we are not growing in the proper sense so we have to cut down the interest rate we we need entrepreneurs even if they are capital intensive they are doing something for the economy so do you think that unemployment in india is growing because of low interest rate policy of the rbi there is not a singular factor behind the growth of unemployment so there are multiple factors that coalesce and lead to unemployment which are the factors we can say sir lack of human capital development uh, of the proper extent uh, lack of proper export policy that pushes our export um, lack of uh, development of the private sector the fixation with government jobs in our country that we have there are some cultural factors as well so why the government is lacking on so many fronts we cannot say that the government is lacking on all the fronts the government is working to some extent but the magnitude of the problem is very large and these are some some of the things are like that we need long term policies for that such as education we long term is how many long how many years uh, wrote an essay sir that 2041 should be the year that we should target so before that you should not hope that an unemployment should reduce we should hope sir but it is the year that we should hope that we will li live we will have maximum employment that is no okay thank you thank you siddharth siddharth you are from delhi yes ma'am how many districts are in delhi there are seven districts ma'am seven districts are you sure exactly sure ma'am there are seven member of parliament so i thought that there would be seven districts no okay tell me uh, uh, what is the population of delhi around 2 crore ma'am around Okay, uh, what is the sex ratio? Don't know the exact figure, ma'am. Okay, so your father is a journalist. So tell me, uh, why nowadays media houses are working like business houses, and journalists are working like businessmen? There is this second phase in the development of Indian journalism, in which we see that journalism itself became a capital-intensive industry. You cannot uh, make a journalistic house or tv network without proper capital development without proper capital support so with big capital behind journalistic houses they are behaving like businessmen because they are part of a professional entity that is run by a capitalist or uh, someone with big capital so is it good for our country it is very bad for our country because the goal of journalism is to put truth before the people and when your truth becomes dependent on who gives you money that is problematic for the country but as of present we are seeing the rise of citizen journalist so it would improve i believe okay so recently uh, government has recently government has uh, brought out a new post of cds in defense services so what is this the cds is the chief of defense staff he is a four star general he is tasked with bringing inter service synergies we have three services the air force the army the navy and we have lack of synergy among them which we witnessed during the kargil war in which the air force was not mobilized for two weeks the army was mobilized so the kargil war review committee said that a post of cds be created for tri service synergy he the cds is tasked with creating uh, theater commands or uh, inter service synergy and headquarters etc so um, from your daf i gather that you read books yes ma'am so tell me what is the last book you have read uh, j krishn murthy's the network of thought the network of thought yes ma'am so explain it's just to me in 20 seconds j krishn murthy says that our consciousness is not ours we are part of the human consciousness and we must behave as such the solution to all our problem lies in our consciousness so we must analyze that not like collecting knowledge about our consciousness but seeing our consciousness our consciousness observing it observing the guilt observing the fear observing the doubt observing the hurt that is in our consciousness and then we have to get over it and then we have to make uh, believe that we are part of the human consciousness and we have to agree that thoughts that run our life we our life is run by thought according to krishna murthy and we have to see that thoughts are different than ourselves they come and go but we remain we who are part of the human consciousness so we must not be run by thought but we must run thought that is the gist of the story that thoughts come and we just run after them desire comes that we want to become in something like this we want to earn 1 crore rupees and we just run after that krishnamurti says that stop 
look at yourself look at your consciousness and then act. so is it related to your hobby meditation yes ma'am it is directly related so what kind of meditation do you do this is a there is a technique of meditation developed by osho it's called nad brahm meditation i practice that nad brahm nad brahm so how is it different from other modes of meditation like raj yog hat yog nad brahm ma'am there is a music developed by chaitanya hari duter he was one of the lieutenant of osho and in that you you produce a sound like hmm that is the sound of the universe according to osho and for 30 minutes you are like humming after that you sit calmly your eyes are closed you open your hand you open yourself to the universe after that you close your hand like this you take the universe back into yourself and then for 15 minutes you analyze your breathing and analyze how you are what you are how you are doing so osho has been a very controversial figure in our history yes ma'am so can you tell me uh, like what is his philosophy core philosophy osho was a professor of philosophy so his philosophy is as eclectic as himself um, osho ma'am is a filter he he puts a- across yourself every major philosopher and he believes that every major philosopher and every enlightened man speaks in one language his core philosophy is of the advaita vedant philosophy that our country is the birthplace of he believes that we are part of the human consciousness like krishna murti he believes that we uh, we have a consciousness we have a consciousness that can be part of the supreme consciousness if we behave okay tell me i was listening to your conversation with one of the board members so you said that you took the decision of participating in civil services under your parents pressure no ma'am i did not say that i said that it was decided very well in the past that i would do that so it's one and the same thing so they suggested you and you complied so uh, does it suggest that after your selection if somebody suggests you with a force or with an authority you will comply with the orders my father said that you my family believed that i can become an ias officer my father said that you become what you want to become i thought about becoming a writer but then i saw that i have administrative acumen i saw that the position of an ias can be something in which all of my energies all of my talents can be utilized and then i chose the ias and when i join a service like an ias that is a public service i would do what i can do to serve the public i then would not comply with forces and orders of others i would do what i have joined the service for doing okay thank you siddharth <clears throat> when uh, you were talking uh, with sir you told that uh, large empire were built in the north india why is it so because sir the north has one of the most fertile plains of the world the gangetic valley uh, fertile plains gives an empire resources every empire is built on resources so when you can have a lot of land revenue and resources from the land you can build an empire you can build a large army and you can expand yourself and, and the north is see, connected to a lot of states in the south when you see a state there is limited connection in the north you can be connected to central asia you can be connected to china across the mountains so the north has significant advantages as far as empire building is concerned okay very nice your name is siddharth yes sir could you compare uh, lord buddha and siddharth means you means if you find any similarities and dissimilarities i was named after lord buddha sir buddha is the paragon of compassion of love and he was the progenitor of meditation and a lot of techniques i believe sir the qualities that the buddha possessed of love of, of compassion i also possess this quality but the difference is merely of degrees while the buddha was the paragon of compassion i am a little less compassionate and i i run behind desires and i get attached to things but if if i can act i act with good sense i can also become like a buddha someday <laughs> good uh, who founded delhi sir the tomar kings of delhi were the founder of delhi anang pal tomar is considered the founder of delhi okay actually nowadays our government has taken decision uh, to glorify the legacy of tomar king anang anang pal second uh, how do you see uh, this step of government sir i believe that delhi was not built in one day or by one king we see delhi there are seven parts of delhi historically delhi was enriched by the, the sultans of delhi delhi was enriched by the mughal kings shah jahan built the shah jahanpur 
so i believe sir history should not be used as a political weapon should not be politicized we must celebrate every historical figure we must celebrate anang pal but not at the cost of others we must see that he was one of the rulers in the part of a series who built delhi okay uh, nowadays chandni chowk uh, is uh, getting makeover could you tell us uh, some history of chandni chowk means uh, who designed uh, the chandni chowk and all that if you know shah jahan built the shah jahanpur it was a walled city and his sisters rosnara and jahanara they wanted to create a market so there was this nehar that ka canal that went from the imperial palace of lal kila and in this nehar or the canal the light of moon was directly shining so this was the chandni chowk it was a center of a market that rosnara and jahanara designed for shah jahanpur around that there was meena bazar the one of the greatest bazar of india in which a noble spent rupees 1 lakh at that time so it was a market built by the sisters of sajana okay uh, you play football yes sir uh, why football is not uh, as much as popular as cricket in india so cricket has a colonial legacy everyone knows cricket a cricketer is very famous in this country cricket is shown 24 by 7 on the tv when there is a cricket match going on but we do not see the similar case about football there are no local clubs there is no transparency if i want to footballer i cannot say that i would do this 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 and i would become a footballer but if you want to be a cricketer you know that you have to play ranji you have to play district you have to play state you will then go there second of all sir our indian football team is ranked very low around 104 in fifa whereas our cricket team is world champion in some aspects so there are problems in football and every other non cricket sports in our country that we grapple with okay your father is a political editor Uh, it is alleged that uh, our media institutions uh, is uh, biased in the favor of uh, government uh, what is your opinion what is your take on this sir we see that sir media does not uh, act in vacuum there would be pressure from the government any government which which is which is at center on the media so there emerges some bias we see during the reign of jawaharlal nehru and indira gandhi everyone believed that all india radio and doordarshan are biased as of now we are seeing that there is some pressure from government but we cannot categorize media as only that which is seen on the television we are seeing the rise of citizen journalist we are seeing independent newspapers who criticize government day after day and we are seeing that press freedom is present in india we cannot say that every newspaper or every tv channel is biased there are independent tv channels there are independent newspapers there are independent citizen journalist okay thank you that's all from my side you are a history student right as i can see and uh, the historical quote that goes uh, with the statement that history is the past politics right yes. and the present politics is the history uh, if i do ask you uh, go back uh, in the past politics and change the course of those past politics so the history's course would be different name any three incident that comes into your mind that i would like to change sir yes sir one of the most thing i would like to change is the colonization of india i would like meer jafar to stand by sirajuddola at plassey uh, the se- second thing i would like is sir the next nas- i would like to give credence to uh, bhagat singh and the uh, one and from modern history one from medieval history and one from ancient history one from medieval and ancient right. history sir in the medieval history i would like aurangzeb to behave betterly such that the glory of the mughal empire remains as it is in the ancient history i would like buddha to be given proper credence that he deserved we see that the post buddha rulers uh, after mauryas did not give that much respect to gautam buddha but it is generally believed that uh, india's fame and uh, its name in the world is mostly uh, being credited to the buddha's uh, contribution to the world peace and other things after the guptas the buddhist philosophy was in decline the rulers did not prefer the buddhist philosophy right. i'm were... getting your point fine uh, since you appeared number of the times for defense services recently we have seen that essential defense services ordinance 2021 has came out almost uh, 70000 plus uh, you know employees they have protested because of the corporatization polit- uh, you know the policies what kind of you know the nature of the protest that is you know going on and what the kind of the response that indian government you know has you know put against it so the ordinance factory boards is not as efficient as a private corporation can be so corporate corporatizing or ordinance factory board is a much needed reform so 
sir we see that the government servants and the pub, uh, private servants there is a large difference between them the government servants have uh, security of tenure they cannot be easily you cannot uh, discontinue their services easily so right to strike has been uh, negated to those employees i mean to say they can't you know uh, stage a protest against the government and all that and heavier penalties have been imposed on that what do you see the state response in this regard sir so there are some essential services that cannot be stopped we cannot say that the army can strike tomorrow and say that we won't fight in ladakh because our service conditions are not good there are some essential services and they must work like railways like textiles so their right to strike must be below public right uh, public order or public uh, service they are servicing public and in some essential services we cannot give them complete right to strike so it can be considered as you know choking of the voices it just simply uh, in a plain manner just like you know raising uh, your voices so you can raise your voice in the newspaper and that is not write. like in a violent manner and uh, constitution of india gives you know the permission for that sir but there is some balance that we have to develop sir we cannot say that tomorrow the delhi police can strike and say we won't work we cannot say that the staff of the aims will not work from tomorrow there are some essential services and they must work if they intend to strike if they intend to raise their voice they can raise their voice in newspapers they can raise their voice through social media channels but if they say that we would strike at a present time when we are seeing a crisis in the northern borders and the ordnance factory says that we won't create ordinances so how would we service, service our army related with this uh, your father is a political editor yes sir uh world freedom of press index india has uh, not done well it's almost 142nd out of 180 countries what kind of the impediments that you see that in india is facing in terms of you know raising the voice or you know the freedom of expression through uh you can say verbal expression or you know uh, some uh, through the press media so we see the mainstream media we can see that there is pressure from the government or pressure from industries but we see the main work of media is done by the local journalist or the small newspapers or the small channels or the regional newspapers these regional newspapers they grapple daily with mafias the local ground based journalist he fears for himself every day and now political editor my father is a political editor of a local newspaper the national coverage so when he writes politically very sharp or politically critical pieces he fears for himself he fears that there can be a retribution from those against whom he has written so the fear of the press is in the ground reporters in the citizen journalist and those who intend to speak truth to power and those who intend to do public service from the journalistic medium uh, my last question to you uh, when the question comes for the content of the code there is a one principle that we call the mulgaonkar principle are you aware of this mulgaonkar principle mulgaonkar principle with the respect to sir uh, contempt of court and you are not aware Fine. Siddharth, I'm supposed to evaluate you, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I missed your conversation with Sir. Can you just uh, give me chronologically the questions Sir asked you so that I can uh, work on that? That Sir asked me about the problems with development of navy in the ancient and medieval time. That Why India did not develop right? a good okay. navy? After that, Sir asked me about the mon monetary policy of the RBI. that rbi is policing a following a loose monetary policy and what impact does that have on employment and why government prefers loose monetary policy or expansionary monetary policy then sir asked me some other question that i have you cannot remember yes sir okay if i have to evaluate you on the basis of your conversation with sir only how much marks should i give you i mean not marks how do you evaluate yourself on that but i believe that i did give proper answers but sir one should not be judge in one's own case that is the first principle <laughs> that is of natural justice. justice right what yes, are sir. other uh, um, uh, principles of natural justice sir the someone who you are going to punish should be given the opportunity to present his case okay. both parties should right be given right to be heard fine right to be heard sir there should be procedural fa fairness and there should be reasonable fairness there should be justice and fairness in the decision i am do not i am not of a law background so don't know all the principles of natural <laughs> justice fine uh, fine sir that it was nice talking to you and we thoroughly enjoyed the conversation your interview is over you can go now thank you sir thank you sir Fine. 
So tell me, how was it? What are the areas you believe you did fine and where you believe that you actually can do better? I was nervous a little bit in the starting. I was a lot of nervous in the starting. Okay, but once you are settled, you are better? Yes, sir. That's the case? Yes, sir. See, uh, our understanding is that you, uh, in many areas, you are basically outstanding candidate. You are a very good candidate. Your personality is definitely very good. And uh, uh, the, the way you analyze things is wonderful. Uh, let's go uh, step by step. Uh, your entry and exit are not the best, if I, if I have to give you a few suggestions. I mean, your entry can be more smart and your exit can be more formal, both ways, right? Entry, the basic template of entry is that you loudly, okay, loudly, in the audible sense, way, you have to take permission of entry, right? From the person with whom your first eye contact is made, right? Depends, wo chair bhi ho sakta, koi bhi ho sakta. so may I come in or may I come in, madam, jo bhi isti bhi hogi, loudly. Then you come, properly greet everyone, then ask for permission to sit down or maybe they'll uh, ask you to sit down, right? This is an entry level uh, template that you have to follow. Similarly, in the exit, thanks thank to the chair first and then to other members, wish them a good day and then move smartly, right? Okay. rehearsal as much time as you can, right? You're a good candidate, your academics is good. Your, uh, generally, uh, your uh, sitting posture is good voice level is good and it has a certain sense of depth in analysis. Uh, so your voice uh, in a sense is complementary to what you're speaking, which is very good. We have seen good voices, we have seen good analysis, but having both in the same person uh, makes you valuable. So you, you, you're, that, that part is very good, though your non-verbal communication is not the best. I mean, especially the hand movement, You, I'm sure you already know it that you have a lot of vigorous hand, hand movement. Yes, you sir. can avoid that. Because uh, in a sense, it affects the uh, formal nature of communication uh, in this kind of interview. So if you can avoid it, it will be good. I know the flies were really uh, affecting a lot, but then, uh, despite, uh, the, uh, other than that also, there was a movement. So My hand can, moves are a lot of them. Yeah, a lot. So you can avoid that. Uh, great idea is to place it like this. So, uh, but then uh, a little hand movement will not hurt. But uh, in your case, it is more than a little, right? Then coming to uh, other areas, uh, your strength is abstract analysis. Uh, I'm still, I mean, we discussed in the board, I'm still uh, not sure. Personally, I liked it a lot. And uh, I'm sure that it will be your strength. Uh, but make sure that it is not going beyond a point. Abstractation, as you understand, is, is, a, is a very good thing. Generally, people like it. But administrators are supposed to be straight, right? Rather than should be able to speak uh, in concrete terms also. Okay, sir. So have abstraction the way you are having, but make sure that you're not overdoing it. Bring it to the ground whenever required, right? Uh, whenever analysis was there, be it history, be it uh, uh, media in general and other things, uh, these were uh, really good. Another suggestion I have uh, is uh, it has to do with uh, your a sentence structure in which you make your sentence you based if you are so if you are so right uh, i've been advising candidates for many uh, years now that uh, using this this sentence structure drags a board member into it suppose you suppose you are a journalist you will be killed uh, uh, this you thing uh, you should impersonalize someone right make it a third person rather than second person that will make it more powerful and board members will be a little insulated from it. If you board members, they will feel like, right, right. So you can work on that. Other things, I am really, really happy. I, I see a very, very good candidate here. I see a very good, good, really bright chance of you getting through Thank really you, good, right. Uh, don't take it, uh, I mean, uh, don't uh, uh, be re more relaxed here. You keep working until your interview is there, but you are already uh, prepared, right? All the best. Thank you, sir.